Welcome to the new sound of online radio. Welcome to the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Yes. You make me feel like I've been locked out of hell. A mix of today's hits and hard to find favorites. Combined with the most entertaining and intriguing talk anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. All right, all right. Welcome to Richard Listens here on UBN Radio TV. I'm the host, Peter Sobey, and I'm always glad to be here with Richard. And we have a very, very big show with lots of great things today. So we're going to get right into it and introduce you to the doctor himself, Richard Olberger, PhD. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> so... We have a lot to talk about today, Richard. As um, people know who might have tuned into the show last week or watched it afterwards, we are following your journey in your adult athletic life. And uh, you were in Kansas this weekend trying out for a basketball team. So we're going to talk about that. And it's very exciting because you literally just got off the plane. Just got off the plane to a Uber, to a car. And came here. To hear. So I don't even know how anything went this weekend, really, outside of just a couple photos I saw. So we have that. We have a guest in the studio today, and uh, it's going to be a lot of interesting information with him because uh, he's a doctor. So we're going to talk about some doctor things, and uh, but we'll leave the introduction in just a moment. We also have a special guest, kind of like a surprise special guest that popped up at the last minute, and it's going to be so incredible to bring her out a little later in the show. She's a extraordinary stand-up comedian who has taken Las Vegas by storm from wow. Vegas. That's crazy, wow. man. Crazy. From Kansas City to Vegas to Yeah. So we got all points covered. And then a little bit later in the show, we're going to have our our feature Richard Listens list of 3 and uh you know, today it's going to be a little bit sad because we're kind of uh, the list of three is involving people we said goodbye to this weekend so I'm sure a lot of our audience members out there can kind of ascertain yeah, a goodbye, few of the people we're going to be or another. Yeah, yeah, that we're going to be talking about and finally I just want to say too before we get into things that we besides being on ubnradio.com channel one right now we are live on Facebook at Richard Listens at facebook.com slash Richard Listens, and we've also shared it on our personal pages. So, you know, hopefully like last, last week, we had a lot of fun with people checking in. So if you give us a like or leave a comment, you never know. We might just uh, bring you into the show a little bit and, and mention you. So that's good fun, too. So make sure to go to Facebook and, and leave us a comment, and, you know, we'll say a little something about you, maybe, if, if you merit it. But I will say, too, if we don't mention you, it might not be because you don't merit it. It might be because it's kind of a slow internet connection here. So sometimes it's a couple minutes behind. So, Richard, let's get yes, straight Peter. into it. And why don't we introduce our first guest of the evening? Thank you, Peter. I'm really happy. This is a time in the coming, uh, especially on, on this day and uh, the excitement of this, this weekend to uh, have our guest tonight. His name is uh, Dr. Matthew Lefferman. I know him in, in quite a few capacities. So um, uh, by day, he's a geriatric specialist, a physician who um, makes house calls uh, in an era where it's very difficult for a lot of the elderly population to make it into treatment and, and can be quite quite a uh, an effort just to make it to an appointment. So he's uh, mobile all across uh, Los Angeles, uh, the Valley, and South Bay, and constantly expanding and making greater efforts to uh, to help people. Uh, he's also, you know, we should call him the commissioner. I don't know if he's got a title, but he's uh, doing a lot for youth sports in the community and constantly thinking about different ways to um, bring sports all the way from ages uh, five and up through, through high school uh, to the community, have more opportunities to learn, build skills, and uh, he's also part of the impetus for my journey, but I think we'll leave that part for 
for for later for so. the conversation. That's right. So, without further ado, Dr. Richard, go ahead. Yes. So, without further ado, here we have Dr. Matthew. Welcome to the show, Dr. Matthew. Thank you very much for that warm introduction. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to Richard. Yes, and thank you for that thank you. So before we get into Richard's journey, we're going to kind of talk about that first because, as Richard said in the introduction, you kind of inspired him for it, and you guys have a lot in common with you know, being adult athletes in competitive sports and being big proponents for children in sports and everything like that. And we're going to get more into your business later, but I do kind of want to just bring up one thing. You specialize in house calls, your your business, correct? Correct. I make house calls specifically for seniors. And the idea is to bring quality medicine to them, be it a physician. uh, Sometimes it's a psychologist like Dr. Olberger, uh, lab technicians, podiatrists, you know, what have you, to try and bring uh, a team approach to seniors who have a hard time getting out to see a doctor. And you've been doing it a while, right? I've had my own practice about seven years now. Because you're basically on the forefront of this new wave of house call doctors. I mean, they're coming out with apps now and, you know, calling it the Uber of house calls and things like that. But you were there, man. I've I've been around for several years, correct? I like to think that I'm one of the pioneers of house calls here in Los Angeles. And others are trying to to do similar similar kind of um, projects. But I think it really it takes a, a unique approach and mentality as far as a physician, a practitioner who's taking care of seniors and who's able to make house calls. It's not your typical day-to-day uh, you know, practice in an office. And just to have a little fun with it, we've got a couple photos to share of some other pioneers of house calls. Can you see those, Jarvis? <laughs> so here we have uh, the original uh, Marcus Welby, MD, and... Uh, Actually, the one we just saw was a doctor from Little House in the Prairie. He made house calls. <laughs> Marcus Welby, he was known to make some house calls. Check him out right Wonderful now. Wonderful show. Wonderful show. And uh, and then finally, this is uh, from 1979 to 1982, the little-known sitcom with uh, Wayne Rogers and Vanessa Redgrave called House Calls, where he played a house call doctor. What the H? I didn't know that. I have to check yeah. it out. Vanessa Redgrave on a, on a CBS sitcom, that just seems hilarious to me. I'll have to go on Netflix and try and see what I... Maybe I can pick up some pointers. So long story short, <laughs> you're following in some pretty big footsteps there, Dr. Matt. Hopefully I'm filling a, a, at least one of the shoes. And you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So now let's get to some meat of the episode. Richard, yes, we are all dying to know about your journey this weekend. And, you know, I think also you should start... We don't have the video representation of it, but... Start with uh, your first arrival into Kansas this weekend. <laughs> well, I just have to say, you know, just being on a part of a trip that's truly amazing, inspiring, everything from the people you meet uh, on the catwalk to going through security, met some fascinating people who, uh, you know, the people of the Midwest, people of Kansas City who gave me a lot of tips and just were like, the excitement, What uh, you know, I uh, wound up meeting a, a young lady who dates someone who works for the Golden State Warriors. So me, people who understand basketball, who understand uh, this process in any way, the, the, the act of preparing yourself, of training, of trying out for something, uh, were really great. But uh, yes, my, my, my arrival to a very stormy Kansas City was, was a, an interesting one um, where um, <laughs> my Uber driver was <laughs> had to have some consultation with uh, the lovely – uh, police of Riverside, Missouri. So, you know, there's just the, so much is out of your control. You, you really just want to get there. You want to get rest. You want to keep your regime going. And things go out of your control. So um, I think, you know, time change uh, is two hours uh, later there. So, you know, getting to sleep, getting rest, uh, finding food at that hour, Um you know, the rules in Kansas City, there's a lot of smoking indoors, things like that. So it was a big, you know, these are minor details, but it is an adjustment in terms of getting your mind ready and prepared for, for a big day. Wow, that's totally crazy. So we've been following this journey, and basically just in case the people that aren't aware what the journey is, you have aspired to play basketball 
as an adult in a competitive league, and you traveled to Kansas City this weekend to try out for the Maccabea Games. That's right. That's and right. Uh, that if you make it on the team, you'll be traveling to Israel to represent America. That's correct. Playing in Israel, that's crazy. It, so Yeah, and, and I, I, this is something I competed in when I was 16 years old and had very fond memories, and, and, and as recently as been preparing for this, some of my old teammates have talked with me, and, and it's just become very vivid and, and alive as if, you know, those, you know, 20-some-odd years are just yesterday. And um, it's gotten me more inspired on the process. Uh, so, and, and we've been doing this work with uh, youth sports and getting kids involved in playing. And then, you know, uh, Dr. Lefferman said to me, you know, there's a, an over 35 and there's, <laughs> this continues. There's an over 45 team. And he was on a team that went to uh, Chile, I believe, uh, last winter and was blogging about his experience and, and the whole journey uh, being working, having a lot of responsibilities, and yet still training and setting higher goals and keeping this this part of you alive uh, that very much is uh, what what has fueled passion in a lot of other areas of life, which is exactly what I'm trying to teach my clients to do. So um, I was kind of presented with this this cognitive dissonance of are you gonna are you gonna step in and face your own fears and confront whatever difficulty will be on this journey and all the doubts, and all the obstacles, uh, including you know expense and flying to random places, uh, uh, or are you going to let it pass on? And, and that simply just wasn't an option right now. Right, and I do want to hear about your journey doing the same thing, Doctor Matt. But Richard, you keep you're kind of Donald Trumping us. You're giving us <laughs> these like these long like uh, like kind of answers, not answering I've never the, been compared the to Donald question. Trump before. Thank you. <laughs> I think. Tell us about your journey that started Friday night when you landed okay. in Kansas and what happened. It was crazy. Well, after, yeah, well, well, after the Uber driver got pulled over by, by the police, <laughs> and after I finally arrived. So you, you, first of all, you get pulled over by the police. Yeah, we get pulled over. He ran through two stop signs. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, it was very rainy there and very dangerous. So, um, yeah, you know, finally I had to ask the, the policewoman if she would be kind enough to uh, – to drive in the last leg of the trip because I think he may have been altered my driver, but uh, <laughs> but so then we you did got it. so the police woman gave you a ride that's to your right. hotel. She completed the last. Wow, leg, that's so. amazing. Yes, protecting. so you got to your hotel. You slept. You woke up. Slept okay. Survived all the people losing in roulette. I mean, it's a very odd environment. Didn't didn't know any of the other players. Right, it's like a casino hotel too. Casino right? hotel with smoking in it. Very you know. Uh, and didn't know any of the other players arriving for this tryout. Very, um, you know, minimal communication. Just kind of show up at this gym at 12.30 on, on Sunday. And um, that's what I did. Found out, you know, had a, had all the, the staff scrambling to figure out where the gym was. And, of course, once the rain cleared, it was, it was walking distance. So that was the good news. And uh, suited up and, and showed up just like, you know, all those times in high school and college when you show up and, and you know that there's going to be some really tough competition. People have been on this journey before, have played for this national team before, and uh, have played at pretty high levels of basketball. And uh, a remarkable coach who's um, actually been entered into the uh, – was drafted in the NBA, Dr. Ed Weiner, and uh, is in the University of Tennessee Hall of Fame, recently wow. elected. So. I think we have a picture of him, Jarvis. Uh, if you could find that, it's, I think, uh, listed under Richard in Kansas. Maybe uh, one of those. Uh, there we go. Yep. Yeah, that's, I mean, look at that guy. He is old. Well, yeah, he's been doing this a long time, and, and, and his, uh, you know, his uh, introduction to the team was this would be one of his last uh, um, roles in the realm of basketball, although I'm sure he'll be mentoring and coaching and with his grandchildren and doing things of that nature. But this is a big journey, I think, for everyone involved uh, to do something international, to to lead a team, yeah, to, to coach even people who are uh, advanced in many other skills or even in basketball at different times to really help build team and build uh, unity and cohesion and to you know to see that building from the first moment is such a valuable gift uh in a coach uh, and i want to get into more details yeah. about your actual tryout but really quick yes 
on our Facebook Live, we do have a question from Matthew Pujo. Pujo. Oh, hi, Matt. And uh, he wants to know, this kind of ties into like your experience. He wants to know, Richard, what did you like about your journey to Kansas City? So like what were a couple of the highlights of your yeah. trip? Matt is awesome. He's been he's been sharing all of our stuff and and we went to high school together. Oh, that's I think awesome. He's down in Florida, so thank you, Matt. Uh, what did I like about Kansas City? Well, I mean, it's great to see different parts of the country meet the people, um, the hospitality, uh, get to see you know just everything from the colors, the different style of food and music they have there, the old fashioned railroad. Uh, the fact that you can see some of the buildings from rooftops there. I mean, there's just different experiences that, that growing up in New York, you wouldn't. And all that is like, makes me feel like a kid again. It's exploring. It's getting to meet people from all over the, the country who are living and, and, you know, getting out of my box a bit. So it was, you know, outside of the, the smoky casino, it's, you know, it's, it's a, an interesting perspective on life and living. That's amazing. So I want to get back to Dr. Matt in a moment, but Tell us, I'm dying to know, like, what was the tryout like? What did they have you do? How did it go? How did you feel? Yeah, well, I mean, it was it was intense. It was uh, probably reminiscent of, you know, hardcore practices in the past. But to go into a, you know, four-hour practice of intensity increasing with a lot of people who have big desire and have played at a very high level, it was, it was highly competitive. It was uh, physically taxing. Uh, the coach was kind enough to be sensitive to our over 35 bodies and give plenty of water and rest breaks in between games. But, but it was a variety of you know skills, drills, and uh, scrimmaging, both uh, half court and full court, and mixing up the dynamics of who you were with and who was playing together. And uh, the, the level of communication and, and uh, competition was just it's excellent. And you felt right there? Did you feel physically good? Was there ever a point where you were like, Oh my God, I'm in over my head. I just need a breather. Or were you right there the whole way? I mean, I definitely felt, you know, that there was only, I think, you know, one extra person sub on each team. So I, I, I welcomed uh, my break every, uh, whatever it was, 30 minutes. But listen, uh, I've been training for this, I've been preparing for the cardio portion, and uh, I love it. You know, there's something that takes over when you're in, you're in the battle. Uh, but certainly, uh, all the training and everything like that, nothing competes to game shape. You know, right. being out there and playing at that level, uh, when the ball started to get sweaty, everyone was like, you know, even skilled players are throwing the ball over their head. And <laughs> I mean, there's certain variables that uh, make things challenging, the human factor. So, um, and how do you, you know, if you, if you miss a shot, do, do, how do you get back on defense? And, and so all that was great, you know, to see my own internal process. Certainly, you know, things didn't go down, baskets didn't all go in. Uh, and how do you battle with new guys? Who who can you communicate really well with and work well with? So all those things got got my hunger going again. And I know one of your goals going in was to kind of assert yourself on the court and maybe assert yourself as a a leader or assert yourself as someone who's going to communicate with everyone. And were you able to do that, or did that get lost in the well, translation? Well, it's a small sample size, and this is you know it's a dynamic of coming into a team that already exists. Some of these guys have competed at a very high level. I believe they won a, a silver or bronze at the last uh, last games in Chile. Uh, so you know, there's also understanding you know one's role. Uh, you can assert yourself and be a communicator and try and understand wh how people think. If there was a miscommunication or an error, you know, what was the thought process going on? Try and make changes on the fly. Some of it's nonverbal, you know, some of it, um, you know, is, is body language. And some of it is, is you can have a talk when you're not in the middle of a heat of a game. Um, and I thought it was really great energy. Just the environment supported that. You know, people encouraging each other after a made layup and a drill. So some of that is just, I think, embodying what the coach is kind of putting out there and, and being respectful of criticism or feedback from, from anybody. Everyone's really a messenger, whether they're on the team before or they're another guy off the street like you. That's awesome. So we're, we'll get a little bit more in the experience, but now let's bring it back to Dr. Matt. Thank who's you, Peter. Who's been waiting patiently over here. And <laughs> Shema's waiting even more patiently right next to me here, but we'll get her. She's in, not interjecting in, at all. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I forbade her to <laughs> interject until her time to interject. But it's a it will be a treat for everyone. Dr. Matt. Yes. You are the one that even introduced the notion of the Maccabea games and such and 
to Dr. Richard. So tell us a little bit about your experience with it. You played soccer, correct? Sure. Uh, so or I play soccer, excuse me. I, correct. I currently play soccer, and as Richard kind of mentioned, there came a time. I I spent have spent a, a lot of time over the past years organizing youth sports. Um, I have three children, 14, 12, and 8, and a lot of my time has been spent trying to get them involved in high-quality athletics. And there came a time where I not couldn't just talk the talk, but I had to walk the walk and put myself out there, like Richard said. And it really helps, I think, as an adult athlete who's kind of coming, who's coming back to competitive sports. I played a lot of soccer growing up, up through uh, college and took some years off between medical school, between two ACL knee surgeries, and really felt like I needed something to focus my attention on and really felt like I needed to do something to push myself and really to be an example for the rest of my family and, frankly, for the rest of the the surrounding community. And the idea of the playing in the Maccabea Games was something that helped me to, to have something to focus on. Just briefly, on the history of the Maccabee Games, they've been around since the 1930s, and they're essentially Jewish Olympics, and they've become, I've heard from someone, the third largest international sporting event. Wow, that's amazing. And so there are games every four years that are in Israel, and then in between there are games in, there are Pan American games and European games. So I tried out and made the Team USA soccer team, for the Chile Games, the Pan American Chile Games, this past December, and represented Team USA. I had a support staff of around uh, 12 or so that went with me, including my family and extended uh, friends. And it was really an amazing experience, as Richard has highlighted, the, the bonds that you make with the other athletes, be it on Team USA, be it on the in the other countries. There were 3,000-plus athletes from 30 different countries. You would expect there to be Jewish athletes in places like Great Britain and Canada, but who would think there are teams that can come from Costa Rica or Belize or Peru, places that you that you really wouldn't think of, and to be able to to bond and experience an athletic competition with them and for my family, particularly my children, to be there was really an inspiring experience, and it really had the feel of you're you're essentially a professional athlete for the week, which is really a great a great feeling. Hopefully, Richard will have that experience in Israel, but you get on the team bus, they've got the, the, the mess hall you go in, you show your, your press pass. Um, I'd like to say that people were asking for my, uh, for my autograph, not, <laughs> not quite, but, uh, it was a, it was a great experience trading of, of jerseys and swag with other teams. I have a closet full of jerseys and shirts and pants from other, all over the world now. How did Um, the games go in Chile? So we actually finished third, and we won a bronze medal. It was uh, quite a thank you very much. It was uh, a great finish. We beat Chile, the host country, which was very tough to do in the uh, bronze medal game. And actually, the I would I think probably the number one player in the tournament was playing for Chile. He was a former professional soccer player who played in Premier League uh, soccer some years back, and was once the Chilean footballer of the year. And was what was really great was that, you know, you would to a certain extent you would think it would just it was all buddy buddy and, you know, let's let's just go out there and have a fun time. But it was, it was a great sporting competition. Like it was very it was competitive, and there were yellow cards, there were a few red cards, but you know at the end of that, uh, that last game when we won the bronze medal, afterwards, you know this this uh, this player his, his name is Sebastian Rosenfeld in particular. He was taking pictures with all the kid you know, the kids who were there. And the Chilean team and the U.S. team, we were taking pictures together. We traded jerseys, and there was a there was a tremendous sense of of a bond and and togetherness, and it really was a was a remarkable feeling. That's really incredible, and um, I want to also get you two talking about children's sports and all that. But we are going to take a quick sidetrack right now to do our Richard listens list of three, and uh, you know I don't want to bring the room down or anything, but uh, it's it's going to be a somewhat somber list. But before we get to the, the three things, I actually do want to bring our second guest into the fold. So, That's um, great. Yeah, bring me in right before the doom. Right. <laughs> right well, before see, the doom. He, he inter- well, introduce a comedian mm. right before something <laughs> sullen. And leave it to a comedian to talk before she's even been properly <laughs> introduced, you know? <laughs> so this comedian, her name is Shema Tosh. I've known her since probably like 97, I think, or 98. 
and she was yeah. in a movie that I co-wrote and produced about stand-up comics. But uh, since I've known her, she's gone on to big things in Las Vegas as a stand-up comedian extraordinaire. So let's uh, give a warm welcome to Shayma Tosh. Hi, Shayma. Oh, that's the kind of introduction I like. <laughs> we go way back. Yeah, we, we do. We do. That was a great. That was a great little film, by the way. I'm going to call it a little film because you know. Yeah, and it never saw the light we, of day. Yeah, but. it didn't. It didn't, but it should have. And you had a, a great cast in that. We did. Yeah, a lot of people that did things before it, and a lot of people that went on to much mm -hmm. bigger and better things. Maybe you can break it back out. Maybe it's kind of one of those films that kind of went through a couple title changes and a couple of editing changes and kind of had a war between the two people that kind of got the project going and mm. it never saw the light of day. But Shema was wonderful in it. She was actually played a stand-up comedian in it and her, <laughs> her bits were very funny. So Thank you. We'll talk Thank a little you. bit more about you because, like I said, Shema, you're going to be like kind of the pellet cleanser after the, the somber list of three. Thank goodness. Well, that's a good thing to follow. <laughs> Great. <Yes. laughs> good to be here. But, you know, and... Obviously, you don't know what the list of three is, so you know, just chime in. It's it's uh, basically what the Richard list, Richard listens list of three is this week are people that we said goodbye to this week. Yeah, come a little closer, Shama. Don't be shy. It's Air it extra dry. All right. <laughs> so um, so it's people we said goodbye to. I think it's going to be kind of obvious, and two of them unfortunately are passed on and gone to another place but we'll start with number one on the Richard Listens list of three is going to be we said goodbye to Vin Scully this weekend and he hasn't passed away or anything like that but he announced his last Dodgers home game yesterday was it yesterday yeah yeah it was oh. just I mean you were out of it but yeah just Sunday night and I saw I saw his uh, speech to the crowd um, and uh, it was just so beautiful and eloquent uh, yeah, and, and he also like he he uh, he recorded. He went to a studio and recorded himself singing "Wind Beneath My Wings" <laughs> that really? he played for everyone at Dodger <laughs> Stadium, and it kind of went up there with like the old Golden Throats albums, you know, with uh, <laughs> you know William Shatner singing and stuff like that. And it was kind of so cheesy, but it was also so tender because yeah. you know he said the Dodgers and the fans are the wind beneath my wings. And He's a class act, and it's really apropos to the conversation we're having because I mean. I I don't understand all. I don't know all of his origins. Um, I I did, you know. My my father grew up in in New York, and I knew the Dodgers came out to L.A. And certainly, um, even being a New York Met fan, when you heard Vince Kelly call a game, you knew something special was going on. And having been out here for the last fifteen years, it's been been you know just phenomenal to listen to the his professionalism, his love, his his positivity. Um, and the truthfulness that he embodies and and it's um it's it's a transition it's it's there's a sadness for the fans he means so much but it, but it's a transition you know he, he joked about at 89 what he's going to do and he said yeah, i'm going to start living and i think that's <laughs> just so beautiful you know for 67 years to do something you're professional but uh he knows he's got other things that he loves as well uh so as yeah. much as it's it's sad in our attachment to him as someone who delivers us uh, and and announcers and sports commentators have a tremendous tremendous effect yeah uh, at least at least for me when I was growing up I mean those those voices uh, are profound so it's, it's a sad day but it's a you know it's a great day for someone that'll you know always be compared it's uh, and to hear about his journey that he came out here I believe with uh, had a wife and two kids back home in New York and came out here and had to compete against I think 250 people so when you talk about going to a tryout and you hear about people who really were willing to give up for their passion, uh, so so it's that's an exciting story, it's an inspiring story, and I Definitely. think no doubt he'll continue to do so. And we're going to move right on to number two on our Richard Listens list of three. And unfortunately, now it's getting a little bit sadder. We <laughs> lost Arnold Palmer last night, and uh, and obviously we're kind of on a sports tip here. So, um, but yeah, eighty-seven years old and. I think he passed away outside of Pittsburgh, I heard, or something like that. I'm not sure if he was visiting or that's where he lived, but talking about leaving a legacy behind, eh, Dr. Richard? Yeah, well, I think he's known as the the king, I believe. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so, um, you know, not a big golf enthusiast, but certainly 
you know, there's an iced tea named after him. I mean, or n numerous iced teas, I believe. I don't, I don't even know how many. I mean, that's the smallest part of his accomplishments. Um, you know, he always being the elder statesman. I mean, golf is always on TV. He's always out there with, uh, you know, Jack Nichols, Nicholas. And when you just read all of the professional golfers today who've been impacted by words or conversations they had from him when they were struggling or along the way, there's kind of like a godfather of the sport. Um, and and it, it's it's hard to hear the sadness that obviously, I guess, over the last decade, he was there was some decline there. But, uh, you know, there was he's still been out there fighting and very emotional every time he was interviewed in the last years just very emotional about his connection to the places of the courses the countries the fans uh it's beautiful to see someone who embodies it and, and was one of the most successful still holds many records i believe dating back to the the 50s and 60s right right yeah quite a legacy left behind so moving on to number one on the richard listens list of three this one's just terribly sad i mean i actually i actually got you know, pretty teary-eyed because uh, number one is Jose Fernandez, the young 24-year-old pitcher for the Miami Marlins, passed away in a really tragic boating accident late Saturday night. And boy, talk about someone getting cut off in their prime of sports. I, I don't remember the last time that there was an athlete of this caliber that we lost at such a young age in the prime of their career. Yeah, I mean, you were you were mentioning before we came on air about, you know, way back to Roberto Clemente and the impact that uh, growing up I only read about uh, that kind of a loss and, and what it did to a team and a generation. Um, and, you know, I only know Jose Fernandez as a, as a rival to, to my New York Mets, but, you know, it's just, it's it's so saddening. It's, it's tragic. I mean, to see someone who's means so much to the people of Miami, his passion, his excitement, I mean, the, the amount of fire that he brought to every time that he went to play the game. And baseball is harder to do that uh, than basketball is. But he, but he certainly was out there and so young, so much talent, so much meaning and promise, and to have this tragedy. It's tremendous loss. And um, I can see already tonight, you know, his team really is rallied around. And, and it's going to be felt. And, yeah. And it's going to be I felt. I mean, they canceled the game yesterday, and then tonight they're all wearing number 16 Fernandez jerseys. Yeah, it's going to be felt. And, and I mean... The season's ending soon, so I, I don't know if that's – at least the players have one week to, to kind of be together for each other. It's, totally. it's really hard to be with someone day in and day out and to have them mean so much as a leader and to that community, uh, to the Cuban community who's been through so much and had to struggle just to make it to right. this country. So, And the irony that was pointed out that he came here on a boat from Cuba and passed away on a boat, it just – yeah, that that he would have you know fought so hard to I think five attempts it took him so to pass away in this way just really your heart goes out and it's a, it's a sad loss and I, and I and I I hope there's some meaning we can find in purpose uh, for his teammates for the sport. How about Shema? I don't know how big of a sports fan you are, but when you hear something like this, how does it hit you? You know, uh, thanks a lot for. Uh, mentioning that I was a comedian before this portion, um, uh, <laughs> just like anybody else, obviously. I mean, it's uh, it's tragic to hear somebody who's in their prime, who has so much ahead of them, who ha is becoming and actively an example for the youth out there. I mean, there's so many bad examples. You know, they're still living. So it's that's it's just tragic to see somebody who's actually doing good in the world taken before their time. Yeah. So I mean, it's just it's just sad. It's just a, it's you know, and I don't, I don't follow sports particularly. I was on, uh, I was on a sports show, best damn sports show, and you know, that's, well, that's it's, right. It's, how it's can pitiful. I forget that? It's pitiful how little I follow sports. Um, um but uh, you know, certain people like we were talking about Arnold Palmer and some of these other people who you know they cross over, even for people like me who don't follow sports at all. You you uh, you get moved by these stories. Right. How about you, Doctor Matt? What's your take on I would say that they're all tragic uh, lo tragic losses they all represented a a segment of the community that is that is really feeling lost be it the the Cuban community um, be it the Brook you know Brooklynites be it the, the Dodgers baseball community as a physician who takes care of seniors I would say that uh, you know the loss of of Arnold Palmer is while, while tragic it's it's a time to really celebrate and you know, what he was able to accomplish. I think Absolutely. Richard touched on 
what he was able to do in his later years and how active and functional he was. I tend to take care of a number of patients with dementia and what have you, but I think what was really a blessing is how he was able to, I think he was playing golf until maybe only a few few years ago, and that's that's really a blessing, and hopefully more people can can look at uh, at their lives and, and living to that age and the amount of functionality that you're able to keep is really, again, it's a, it's a blessing and worth, worth celebrating. Yeah. And staying active and involved with others, what that does for yeah. your longevity. And this is such an yeah. example, uh, by the way, of you just never know how much time you have on this earth. And yeah. I think we all take it for granted. And, uh, to see something like this is, is a reminder for everybody to, to live like it's your last day. Now that's not yeah. always the best advice. Right. right. You know, because, you know, there are some people, I took that advice from a friend years ago, and uh, she said, live every day like it's your last. And I, so I, you know, maxed out all my credit cards and told everyone <laughs> I hated how I really felt about them. I don't think that was really my friend. But, you know, you don't want to follow it to a T, but, you know, But for even all being a stand-up comic, right? You have to yeah. live like, I mean, to get up there and face that. I mean, you're trying out every time you go in front of camera, right? Or you go in yeah. front of the audience? Well, you know, and, and, uh, comedians, when we take risks, I mean, it, it can be, uh, very humiliating, obviously it's, it's a discomfort, but you know, it's really not a, you know, a terrible thing to have people not like you. I mean, there's so many worse things in the world and you have to remind yourself of this. And mm -hmm. like the last week that the, uh, Riviera comedy club was open, uh, I was asked to perform there and that was a perfect example of, uh, letting the ego go and just living in the moment because once I got my check on Thursday, I knew they couldn't fire me, you know, <laughs> and even my ego couldn't care mm -hmm. as much as it usually did, you know, does about how the audience feels because the place is going to be blown up. So I don't even have to worry about whether they're going to invite me back, you know. So I took liberties that yes. last few days and I said things on stage that I hadn't said for a decade or more prior to that that just I just decided to do improv with the audience and I said I don't want to do any of my jokes and I want to live like you know this place is going to be blown up but you know that's you should live that way all the time and it did transform my stand up just having that attitude so wow and so I think just hearing that if this were our last show ever that's yeah. good advice to hear but yeah. it's not our last show ever it isn't <laughs> and I will interject here that last week's guest David Bannock has checked in with us and Awesome. He says, welcome back, Doc, and his fingers are crossed for you as far as uh, making the Maccabea team. Thank you. Thank you, and I appreciate and, Dave uh, and anyone else who was, who was, I felt their support, you know, it was like people really, you know, gave me that final push to go through the door, and, and right after we're like, you know, hope it went well. So that meant a lot. Totally. To have and anybody thinking of you amidst their busy lives, I, I appreciate that. And he also says, let's get Dr. Matthew and Peter into Studio Gym <laughs> ASAP. How did I know that was, that was coming? Yeah. And then, uh, and he says... True that, to his brand. <laughs> and he says, you're welcome as well, Shama, even though you're in Las Vegas. But he was our guest last week, and he's co-partner in a gym called Studio Gym, but spelled with an E. And it's a, it's a really, it's like a, they, they base it on a boutique hotel, so it's, it's a really cool gym. Well, thank you yeah. for including me. I'm actually uh, in the process of moving back to... Los Angeles. Holy after many cannoli. Years. Oh my God. For many years in Las Vegas, opening for Carrot Top. Right. And, uh, which was, by the way, a blast. And are you there we Carrot have Carrot Top a, with you? Or? And there we have. Oh, he comes out a, every now and again. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we we are guess. showing a picture of you with Carrot Top because who, uh, oh, who wow. doesn't want a photo with Carrot Top? Right? Classic. <laughs> Look, I had different hair back then. Uh, yeah, that was with uh, the actor from Hawaii Five-0. What is his name again? I don't even know. It's I, I terrible. It well. We need a research department. Uh, and then also Paul Shortino, who is in the uh, Rating the Rock Vault show out there in Vegas. And uh, the Carrot Top. The Carrot Top, which is a, a great person to work with and for. And uh, that was a hell of an experience. And we I also have, have a it picture here. Very unique. We have a picture of you next to a stretch limo with the Dice Man. Yes, so I you just recently opened for him, or yeah, I recently opened for him. You know, it's strange because uh, I had done a gig prior to this, which made me question whether I wanted to continue to do comedy. Honestly, it was it was one of the worst gigs of my entire career, and it's so many years into my career, it's just it was just daunting. I couldn't believe it. I had this gig for a cruise line. 
And uh, I knew that there were a conservative audience and, and my agent said, you know, you're going to have to keep it clean. And I said, fine. I go, what about PG-13? Is that OK? Is that considered clean? We're all adults here. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, yeah, but just try to keep it on the conservative side. And the cruise director, you know, right before I went on stage, he encouraged me to do whatever I want. I said, you're not going to want me to do whatever I want because you're going to get complaints. He goes, I don't care about a few complaints. I know you're going to get a lot of complaints. And he said, well, listen, I want to attract a younger audience. That's why I hired you. Do what you usually do. Just have fun. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm i looking at these people. I'm thinking that's probably going to be a bad idea. But he was so encouraging, and I felt so safe. He goes, listen, I love what you do. I'm going to keep booking you. It's all good. Just go out and knock yourself out. Say whatever you want. Just just have a good time. Do your, your usual regular act that you do in Vegas. I said, okay, great. So I went out there, and I did that. I did not go as far as I normally do. I will say that. I, I was going to pull back to 50%. I gave them 75. They were horrified. <laughs> they were horrified at the 75. So I had an hour between shows, and I honestly, I felt like a piece of my soul was missing. So I said, I got I to gotta make this fun for me because I, if, if I pull back, they're going to feel that tension. If I give them everything, well, I may never get hired again, but at least I'll have a good time. So I decided to do that the second show. The cruise director's, director's wife was there, and she got up in the middle of my set. She I love you. She just was cheering me on, and they were so into it, and I got all these bookings out of it. And then I heard from my agent soon after, and he said that there were 107 complaints. There were only 108 people at the show. So I thought that was pretty bad. <laughs> so I and it was, was unprecedented. You brought people no, together. No, she didn't. Yeah, yeah it's, really... exactly. And it was unprecedented. So I, I, I said to myself, you know, maybe I should just rethink this whole thing because, you know, my voice is extremely offensive to this group of people you know, what should I do? I was literally, I was, I was, I was praying to God. And yes, I do. And I was praying to God. I was like, what, what, what am I supposed to do here? Am I supposed to, I want to tell these filthy jokes. And I, my God has a sense of humor. My God knows when something is a joke. It's, it's all really the intention behind your words. That's the most important thing. Uh, so I was, I was looking for guidance. I said, just send me a sign. I, you know, this is the path I want to go on and send me a sign. That very night, I got a text from Andrew Dice Clay and he said, do you want to open for me? And I said, I won't directly quote myself, but I said, F-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-U-
and have quality athletic experiences can be very difficult. And there are people who unfortunately need to compromise. And being here in Los Angeles, there are a lot of Jews living here and there are rec organizations that have space. And I've been able to approach them about making Sunday friendly teams so that the Jewish community can benefit as well, be it in AYSO soccer, um, in the Hollywood region, be it Beverly Hills Little League. And for myself as well, I've, I've started a Jewish club soccer team to get these boys uh, and girls playing together and playing on a, on a high level. And I think you know, my general um, mantra is that our kids have very busy schedules, very busy lives. Uh, my kids go to a Jewish, Jewish schools and they're learning a lot of English studies, Jewish studies, and their days end late. And for them to have these outlets is, is really important. I mean, I, I, frankly, I wish that sports and nutrition and was more a part of the, the general education, not just obviously his, history, English is very important. An example I frequently like to use is that I don't remember any of the czars of, of Russia at this age, but sports and nutrition, what I eat, how I exercise, how I stretch, is something I, I use on a daily basis, and and hopefully in years to come that will be more part of the the, the general curriculum and training that that kids get. And it's good for guidance, by the way. Can I just say I wish I had that guidance. I wasn't able to play sports as a kid, so I'm glad that kids now are able to. I really think that I would have turned out differently. So you know, I wouldn't I don't be know if that's reprimanded a thing, on or... a daily basis <laughs> for my language. <laughs> so we do have to wrap things up. So. Was that five minutes or five seconds? Five minutes? Oh, okay. So That's right, because we started a little bit late. Here so I, I think, was like... Yeah, I think Shane was going to take Dave up <laughs> on his offer now, because she's saying if she does some push-ups, she might get right. some of those. I, I want to get back in the swing of things. <laughs> I, I really wanted to play baseball when I was a kid, so maybe I can do this now. I'm so glad you guys are wow. an example. Here I am, an adult. There I can are, do this. There are girls in uh, Beverly Hills Little League. You see? Okay. And, right. uh, and Dr. Well, Matt... Uh, Dave Bannock said, well said. He liked what you said there Thank about you. youth sports. And really, there needs to be more people and parents out there that are kind of giving their kids these opportunities because, you know, we are, we're not going to get into health and nutrition and, you know, but Correct. there is an obesity situation and, and kids what, aren't getting out enough. Their parents are pushing them like you are. And what better environment to experience failure, you know, which we all go through in life, but to, you know, to strike out in front of your friends and your parents who are close by who can console you afterwards, I think is a much more, you know, it's a very supportive uh, environment. Absolutely. So even though we have four minutes left, I want to kind of wind things down. We never really got into your practice and stuff. So just, you know, really, you said you're specialized in geriatrics. You make house calls. You've been doing it for a while. If people want to reach you, um, give, give us that information. We don't have an info card, Jarvis, by the way, so don't look for that. But go ahead and tell us, Dr. Sure. Matt, like so how my, people can reach you. My website is uh, uh, www.accesshealthca.com. That's A-C-C-E-S-S-H-E-A-L-T-H-C-A.com. That's like a jingle. Yes. And then how about an email and phone number if they want to reach you that way? It's all it's on the website. They okay. Can, they can find me there easily. And um, Shema, okay. I'll my now pass it to you like you're transitioning back to Los Angeles. I can't wait <laughs> yes. to hear more about that. But Well, my phone number can be found on most um, restroom walls. So <laughs> I hear. <laughs> now I, uh, you were in the bathroom earlier, right? Reachable. So I'll have I to go and check that go out. Go check it out. I tag yeah. it everywhere. And uh, so uh, you, I can be found at shamatosh.com. That's S-H-A-Y-M-A-T-A-S-H, not T-O-S-H, as right. many think, mm -hmm. dot com. And uh, I'm also on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook Shamatosh, occasionally. Right? Yep, Shamatosh. At Shamatosh. At Shamatosh. And I'm on Instagram as at Donut Spirit. And Richard's on Instagram as at Richard Listens. At Richard Listens, yeah. And um, I also want to encourage people, you know, that, uh, you know, Richard, as you see throughout the show, is like such a fountain of knowledge, inspiration. Seriously, like, you know, I, I joked about you, like, giving these long, flourishing answers that weren't actually answering my question, but... <laughs> What you're doing is like you are giving people like really good information and inspiration and I stuff. I think you called me Trump like actually. Yeah, well I said I think you were trumping us or something. So <laughs> very appropriate for the debate here. But I do want to encourage people like you know even after the show we post a link to YouTube to the show 
And, you know, Richard, you're totally open if people want to, like, leave comments and ask questions and get your viewpoint on things. Like, yeah, send, send us Please a message do. or leave a comment, even better, so everyone can learn from it. Yes, I love it. It's all an opening, interactive process, and I love even this discussion. You know, we, Peter and I have been tracking the comments during the week, and it's great to see how this is inspiring different people just to get moving. I mean, we talk about organized sports and all these high-level trials. We're just you know mainly want people to uh we want to get active we want you to get happy we want you to find your passion and whatever that is and wherever that can be and however that can be uh you know if it's if it's a word from us that'll help but uh you know uh we're just thankful you're reaching out and uh on a final note because we did address your whole journey and stuff like that this week i want to show jarvis can you put up the picture i made a little graphic for richard to inspire him on his journey of uh, the wizard of oz <laughs> so, because uh, in his blog this week, he kind of compared his journey to Dorothy's and the Wizard of Oz. So, we got a photo here of the Scarecrow and the Lion doing some heavy-duty balling. <laughs> You're really revealing the inner inner secrets now. Well, hey, my daughter chose that as a family movie last week, and uh, I remember getting very scared about the tornado and the Wicked Witch. So, um, I overcame my fear. I made it to Kansas. And got out. Okay. Yeah, and so now we're just going to be very excited to kind of track the progress of things because now it's just kind of a waiting game for you, right? It's a waiting game. It is. We'll but know. you are going to continue working out and keeping fit. and Absolutely. There's a, you know, give myself a day or two to recover. Uh, but absolutely, you know, it, it's continuing on the same journey, but also, you know, maybe incorporating some some yoga or some stuff to keep, make sure that the strength is being balanced out with, uh, you know, balance. And once you get word that you've made the team, then you're going to have to go hardcore. There will be uh, the process involves some training camps. So and uh, and yeah, they'll, but everything has to be in balance. Has to have nutrition. Has to have rest. Got to care for these uh, these old bones and muscles. That's part of it. All right. Well, hopefully you'll all track his progress through blogs and through Facebook.com/slash Richard Listens. And one more time, thank you to Dr. Matthew Lefferman. Thank right. you, Shayma Tosh, thank for you. being on the thank show. Thank you. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks here on The Richard Listens Show.